you can turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Psalm chapter 19. We're going to be looking at verses 7 to 14. For those of you who haven't been with us, we've been going through a sermon series on spiritual disciplines. And so far, uh, we've gone over the discipline of fasting, uh, praying, and also mortifying. Uh, The next three weeks, we're going to go over, just to give you a preview, uh, resting, giving, and singing. Uh, Today, we're going to go over the discipline of reading, and namely reading the Bible. Um, I would say uh, out of all of these disciplines that we have gone through or that we will go through, this is the most important uh, discipline. Um, There are seven disciplines that we are going to be covering, and I place this smack in the middle, and I believe that this is the uh, foundational discipline because all other disciplines are actually born out of this one discipline. You know, why do we pray? It's a response to the reading of the word. Why do we fast? It's a response to the reading of the word. Why do we give or uh, mortify our flesh? It's a response to the reading of God's word. So this is uh, by far uh, the most important and foundational discipline. And so, um, yeah, with that in mind, we really want to uh, seek to become uh, better readers uh, of God, God's word. And so once again, uh, if you can turn with me to Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 to 14. And if you have found your places, please stand with me out of reverence for God's word. And please give your full and undivided attention to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word starting with verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of God. You may be seated. And let's once again bow our heads and ask God to give us help, insight, and illumination into his word. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Lord, you say that your word is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword that even pierces, Lord, um, to the very core of our beings. And so we pray that as we delve into your word, you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your law. Father, as the psalmist said, we pray that you would incline our hearts to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Father, we pray that Uh, This word uh, that is described to be as desired even more than gold, God, would be seen as precious and valuable to us. Uh, Father, we do also confess that uh, we are unable to understand the deep mysteries of your word. And so we do pray also at this time that through your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would grant us insight, understanding, and illumination into your word. Father, if we have dulled senses, God, would you sober our minds? Would you soften our hearts? God, would you satisfy our souls in and through your word? And so I pray for the preaching and the hearing of your word. May the words of my mouth and the med- meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, C.S. Lewis, he wrote that Psalm 19 is the greatest poem in the Psalms and one of the greatest lyrics in the whole world. 
Uh, if you look at Psalm 19, uh, you can see that it's divided into two halves, verses 1 to 6 and then verses 7 to 14. Um, and the way that David divided up this psalm is basically in verses 1 to 6, he is almost looking at God through the lens of a telescope, whereas verses 7 to 14, he's looking at God through the lens of a microscope. And so verses 1 to 6, you could say that he's looking at God in the sky, and verses 7 to 14, he's looking at God through Scripture. So verses 1 to 6, uh, it is showing us visual rev revelation, whereas verses 7 to 14 shows us verbal revelation. And if you were to ask, what's more important, visual revelation or verbal revelation? I would have to say it's verbal revelation. And the reason is because uh, although in verse 1, David says that the heavens declare the glory of God, it is only the Bible that declares the will of God. Romans 1, it also says that all people can know that there is a God through the general revelation of creation. But we cannot know who this God is or what he requires without the special revelation of his word. So we need this more specific revelation in order to know who God is accurately. Therefore, God, he chose to reveal himself through words that we may know who he is and what he has done for us. God's word, the Bible, is the most important thing that he has given to us that we may know him. The Bible is the foundation of our faith. Without the Bible, we have no faith. Yet quite often, some of us don't see the Bible for all it's worth. Some of us may think that the Bible is just an irrelevant, outdated history book. Some of us may think that the Bible is just a rule book, or just a list of do's and don'ts for religious people. Some of us, we just think that the Bible is just a difficult book to read. And for some of us, uh, to be honest, we just think that the Bible is very boring. Whatever your view is on the Bible, I would like to give us this morning five reasons why you should devote yourself to the reading of the Bible. Besides God commanding us to do so, uh, I would like to give us five additional reasons why we should devote ourselves to the reading of his word. And so uh, the first uh, reason is because the Bible is the word of God. We should read the Bible because the Bible is the word of God. What does it mean that the Bible is the word of God? It means that the Bible is authored and inspired by God. If you look at verses 7 to 9, the phrase of the Lord is repeated six times. It talks about the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, commandment of the Lord, rules of the Lord. Now, these are all synonyms of Scripture, yet they all shed light on various dimensions of Scripture. Law, testimony, precepts, commandments, rules. All that to say, uh, God is the creator and the owner of every word in the Bible. The Bible is ultimately not the law of man or the testimony of man. It is the law of the Lord. It is the testimony of the Lord. The Bible is an autobiography, not a biography. The Bible is not man's word about God. The Bible is God's word about God. The Bible doesn't just contain God's message. It is God's message. And some additional verses that help support this. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. It says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. 2 Timothy 3.16, which we heard from a couple weeks ago, says that all Scripture is breathed out by God. What does that mean? It means that even though it is naturally written by the hand of man, 
it is at the same time supernaturally uh, written by the hand of God. Although man might be the pen or the instrument, God is the ultimate designer. Now you might ask, does that mean that the human writers, the human authors of the Bible had no influence on the text of um, the Bible in terms of like their language or their background, their personalities, their writing styles? No, for sure they did have influence on the writing of the Bible. The human writers definitely had their own passions, their personalities, they had their own cultures and contexts that were allowed to be expressed. Each human writer of the Bible was distinct and unique from another. And it is precisely for that reason that God specifically chose each person for these various differences. It's kind of like a poet who uh, has his favorite writing tools. And let's say, generally speaking, he likes to use the black pen. That is the standard writing tool, and he likes the black ballpoint pen. But there are certain sections where he might want to write with a red pen. Or maybe in another section, he wants to use a number two pencil. Or in another section, he wants to use a calligraphy pen or a marker or a paintbrush. You see, each writing tool is definitely unique, distinct, and purposeful, just like Moses is different from David, and David is different from Peter, and Peter is different from Paul. But God is the one who uses these various people from various times and various stories as his instruments to write his one unified, dramatic, redemptive story. So 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 20 20 and 21, it says, No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men who spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that the apostles received supernatural revelation from God through the Spirit to write His very words. Through through the prophets and apostles, uh, even though they were themselves, it says that they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit superintended this writing process. So why should we read the Bible? Because it is the Word of God, which means that it is authored and inspired by God. Also, it means that the Bible is also trustworthy and reliable. The Bible is trustworthy and reliable. Let's look at various phrases uh, through verses 7 and 9. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. The rules of the Lord is true and righteous altogether. Uh, Theologically, two words that describe this perfection are uh, the words inerrant, and the word uh, infallible. Inerrant uh, simply means without error, and infallible uh, simply means unfailing. Um, And that basically means, once again, that the Bible is trustworthy and reliable. The doctrines of inerrancy and infallibility are based on the understanding that God is perfect in his character. Since God is perfect, his word is perfect because God is the one who wrote, uh, who not only wrote the word, but actually is the word. We know John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so he's not only the author of the word, he actually is the word. If the Bible were imperfect, that word that would be to say that God himself is imperfect. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Proverbs 30, verse 5, it says, Every word of God proves true. All 66 books of the Bible. Now, us living in 2019, us being very modern people, uh, we oftentimes have an objection. 
Uh, and the objection is this. Doesn't the Bible we have today, here in 2019, doesn't the Bible that we have today have real errors, such as typos and inconsistencies, discrepancies? And to that objection, I would say it's, it's not a very easy answer. It's a very yes and no answer. It depends on how we define the word error. If we were to define the word error as imprecision or not precise, then technically, yes, the Bible, this may sound heretical, but the Bible actually does contain errors. However, if we define error as falsehood, lies, untruth, kind of like what we uh, read this morning in the, through the ninth commandment, lying, then no, the Bible does not contain errors. There is a difference between something that is not precise and something that is not true. Uh, and I'll just give you like a modern day example of that. If you were to ask me, uh, like Pastor Joe, um, this iPad, like how much, how much is an iPad? And I tell you, it's four hundred dollars. But let's say technically, it's three ninety nine plus tax. If I told you it's four hundred dollars, did I lie to you? Or did I say an error? I would say I was not precise, but I'm not actually lying to you. What if I uh, didn't buy it uh, in Pennsylvania? Let's say I bought it in Delaware, and it's Three ninety nine without tax. You know, if I said four hundred, does that mean I'm lying to you? No, it doesn't mean I'm lying to you. It means I'm not precise, but I'm not trying to deceive you. Uh, if I were to also say, um, you know, Pastor Nick and I have the same last name, uh, I may technically be incorrect because uh, our last name is is spelled differently. However, you all know that I'm not lying. It's basically the same thing. I'm telling the truth. While it may be spelled differently, it's the same exact thing. Likewise, the Bible may not always be technically precise in uh, the version of it that we have here today, but I want to assure all of you that it is absolutely trustworthy and reliable. Inerrancy means that the Bible is true, not that it means that it's maximally precise. The Bible does not convey anything that is false. The Bible asserts truth from beginning to the end. Now, many of you know that the Bible that we have today, today even in the original languages, are not the original, original manuscripts that were written by these uh, prophets and the apostles. We have copies upon copies upon copies upon copies. And if we want to be very technical, there are uh, found to be maybe some typos, some human mistakes, some printing errors among the copies. However, these so-called errors or typos, again, I want to assure you, it does not change any doctrine of our Christian faith. The errors are as simple as punctuation, maybe different word orders, minor grammatical issues, a spelling error such as a angel instead of an angel, or uh, discrepancies such as maybe using the phrase the gospel of God instead of the gospel of Christ. Uh, again, none of these inconsistencies or discrepancies change any doctrine or historical fact. Now, knowing that we have copies upon copies upon copies upon copies, some of us think that the Bible, the way it was formulated, the, the Bible that we have today is kind of similar to uh, the game that we sometimes play at retreats, like the uh, telephone charades game, right? Where one person has the original story, and then uh, what happens through the game is the second person is meant to copy that first story, and then the third person copies the second per person, and then the fourth person copies the third person, so on and so forth, so that by the time you get to the tenth person, we realize the story has been totally twisted and mutated, right? Um, 
it's a funny game when uh, we're watching it as a game, but it's not funny when it comes to copying the Bible, right? But we also need to understand that the copying process of the Bible is not like telephone charades. That it's not one person copying the original and then the third person copying the second person and the fourth person copying um, the third person. But it's actually all the people copying, they're all copying the original. So if there were uh, 10 scribes, it's not like only one person copies the original and then so on and so forth in a sequential order. But they all copy um, the original. Or maybe it's like the original is read aloud and then all the scribes are copying what is read aloud. So they are all copying the original copy. We need to realize that the copying process was done very reverently, very painstakingly. Groups like the Masoretic scribes, they had the strictest rules governing them, such as even spacing of words, size of columns, the ink they used, the parchment they used. Writing from memory, it was clearly forbidden. They were not allowed to just write from memory. Lines, words, and even letters were accounted for double-checking. Now, you might object again, and you might say, well, then how could there be any errors if they had such a strict method of copying? Shouldn't it be fail-proof? And I would say that's kind of like asking, uh, how could my iPhone have a bug if uh, millions of iPhones are produced from the same factory? You, know, you might say, uh, is my iPhone fake? And we would all know that, no, it doesn't mean your iPhone fake. It just means that things like that happen. It doesn't matter how strict of a method you create, in the supply chain, even with double checking, even with triple checking, there is just bound to be human error. Does that mean that your iPhone is unreliable? You may say so, but I would say the answer is no. It doesn't mean that the iPhone is uh, unreliable, even though this one iPhone might be a lemon. Again, it means that uh, while these errors may point to some imprecision, it does not point to lying. Uh, many of you also know that the words written by the prophet Isaiah's actual pen are actually still found available today on what we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. F and these were uh, found in 1947, dated uh, to be written around um, 150 BC. Uh, prior to this finding, the earliest copy of uh, the book of Isaiah was around 900 AD. Now that's over a thousand year gap. 900 AD and around 150 BC. That's around a thousand year gap. But you know what these you know, scientific scholars found when they actually compared this copy from 900 AD to this copy that was found you know, 150 BC, they found that it was 99% exactly the same. 99% exactly the same. Brothers and sisters, as David says in this psalm, God's word is sure, it's right, it is pure, it is trustworthy and reliable. Don't allow imprecisions to shake your faith. Rather, marvel at the fact that among all, over 5,000 copies of these original manuscripts, the exact same message has been passed along from century to century to century. Now moving on to the second main point, and these points will go a little bit faster. Uh, the second reason why we should read the Bible is because the Bible grows us. The Bible grows us. And first, how does it grow us? The Bible grows us mentally. Uh, at the end of verse 7, it says that it makes wise the simple. And at the end of verse 8, it says it enlightens the eyes. You know, before I went to college, to be very honest, I barely read the Bible. Um, although I attended church every single week, uh, I just didn't read my Bible. 
Uh, and the, although I was growing up physically, you could say I was not growing up mentally. But it was actually in college when I actually started to read the Bible. It was in college when somehow this light switch turned on. And maybe it was because I was for the first time going to church on my own initiative. Maybe it was because I was blessed by various pastors and various brothers that inspired me. But I began to read the Bible. I began to study the Bible. And these words started to come alive to me. I remember as a freshman in college telling myself, I never knew what the word grace meant until now. Although I sang about it just like we sang about it this morning. Although I read about it, uh, you know, and although we talk about it all the time, I never knew what the word grace meant until now. You know, stories started to click and connect for me. Doctrines started to make sense. And I developed a hunger and thirst for truth, a hunger and thirst for theology. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, Scripture is profitable for teaching. Scripture teaches us. It grows us. It grows us mentally. And this is a process that we all need to continually experience. Even Jesus grew mentally. Um, when he was 12 years old, Luke chapter 2, it says, After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Think about that reality. I think some of us, we think that Jesus was just born with just all the omniscience of God, even as a human being, but he wasn't. Even as a human being, he had to grow. He had to learn. He had to sit and listen. So he actually did that as a child. Jesus, the Son of God, the Word of God, was actually sitting among teachers of the Word, listening to them and asking them questions. So even Jesus himself had to grow in his human mind and intellect. And so uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And so as you seek God in his word, ask him to increase you in knowledge and wisdom and also in enlightenment. But I would say that growing mentally is not nearly as important as growing spiritually, which is how the Bible also grows us in. The Bible grows us spiritually. If you look at the beginning of verse 7, it says that it revives the soul. More important than just gaining information is undergoing transformation. You know, there are very smart individuals, many religion scholars who study Scripture very intensely, but at the same time are not saved. They have very brilliant minds, yet their eyes, the eyes of their hearts are not open to surrendering to God. You know, Saul, the Pharisee, he knew the Bible. He knew the Bible inside and out. He was an expert of the law. He was what we would say a modern-day lawyer. He graduated from the top law school of his day. He was personally tutored by this honorable professor named Gamaliel. He knew the Torah like the back of his hand. Yet, it was not until he was blinded by Jesus that he began to actually truly see who the prophets were ultimately pointing to. So as you, too, read the Bible, ask God to not only tickle your minds, but ask him to touch your hearts, because that is what is most important. The last thing you want to be is a Pharisee. You want to be faithful, and you want to be following the Spirit. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 it says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit. The word of God is like a scalpel that performs heart surgery on us, cutting off deep-rooted sins and idols in our lives. And although it may hurt, we know that it will bring greater healing. And so... I encourage you to come to this great physician 
and be changed from the inside out. Third reason why we should read the Bible is because the Bible gratifies us. The Bible gratifies us. The end of verse uh, verse 8, it says, uh, rejoicing the heart. The Bible rejoices the heart. In verse 10, it says, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. In this life, there are many things that can make you happy, but there are not a lot of things that can give you joy. Happiness is based on your circumstances, but joy is based on certainty. You can feel happy when you get a good grade, when you get an acceptance email, when you eat good food. Those things can make you happy, but all those things we know are circumstantial. They quickly come, and they also quickly leave. But joy is not circumstantial. Joy is continual. Joy is constant. And God's word provides joy, even when you feel unhappy, because it is based on the certainty of God's promises. So when you get rejected, when you fail, when you suffer, you can even then have joy knowing that you are a child of God, that God is with you, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, banking on the promises of God, that he has a plan and purpose for you, even if that means suffering, even if that means being refined in the fire. God may not give you what you want, but God gives you what you need. And what you need most of all is more of him. You may think that you need more possessions or more products or more validation or more respect or more likes or more laughs. But what you really need is the love of God. That's what you really need. And when you're reminded of God's perfect love for you, that God can't love you any more or any less than he does right now because he loves you in Jesus Christ, there's nothing that gives you more joy, more security, more satisfaction than that. It is more valuable than even gold, and it changes you from the inside out. And it is like honey. Um, My wife and I, we have been giving our youngest daughter honey, and it's not just any honey. We don't just give her organic honey from like Trader Joe's. We give her this honey called Manuka honey. I don't know if you know what Manuka honey is. I didn't know what Manuka honey uh, was, but we've been recently giving our daughter Manuka honey, and it's really expensive, actually. It's like $30 for this like little jar. I'm like, what is Manuka honey? Uh, but our, d- our youngest daughter has eczema, and you know there are a lot of things that we've been trying to do to like help her with her eczema. Uh, And we read that Manuka honey uh, helps treat eczema. And so Manuka honey, it's made in Australia and New Zealand by bees that pollinate this Manuka bush. And this specific Manuka honey, it treats uh, various conditions, Uh, not only eczema, but inflammation. It, It supposedly treats wounds and affections. It treats uh, gastrointestinal problems. And so we're like, you know, we might as well try it. You know, we want to do anything that would alleviate her eczema. And, you know, we've been giving it to her. And we noticed that, you know, she scratches herself a lot less. You know, she would usually scratch her, like, elbow area almost every day. And it's always red. But, you know, after we've been giving this to her, you know, she's scratching herself a lot less. That her scratching has now virtually disappeared. And this honey... uh, we could say it satisfies her, it gratifies her, not only in terms of its taste, but in terms of the transformation that it brings, that it not only, you know, satisfies her taste buds, but it actually gives her relief, joy inside of her heart, inside of her entire soul. And likewise, we could say that the Bible, God's word, is even greater than Manuka honey. That is something that literally, uh, inside and out, 
not only mentally, but spiritually, emotionally, physically, it actually gratifies you to the very core of your being. So that is another reason why uh, we should read the Bible. Fourth, we should read the Bible because the Bible guards us, and namely, it guards us against sin. In verse 11, it says, Moreover, by them, talking about the word, God's scripture, by them is your servant warned. Verse 12, who can discern his errors? Verse 13, keep me back, your servant, also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. We need to realize that if the word doesn't guard us, it is the world that guides us. If the word does not guard us, it is the world that guides us. And I don't know about you, but the way that I see it, many things that the word says is right, the world says is wrong. And many things that the world, the word says is wrong, the world says is right. Oftentimes, the word and the world live in tension and in contradiction with one another. Thus, if we are unable to discern error apart, uh, we are unable to discern error apart from God's word, God's law, God's standard, because we all know that the world has different standards. The world has different teachings. The world has a different message. The The world has different morals. Our nation may have been founded upon biblical principles, but that's not the case anymore. So all the more... We must live according to our Father's rules, not according to our feelings. It is the Word that warns us. It is the Word that restrains us. It is the Word that corrects us. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says that the Scripture is also profitable for rebuke, also for correction. Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. And also verse 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So it is the word that keeps us pure, that guards us. It is the word stored up in our hearts that causes us not to sin against him. That's why we should not only read the word, that's why we should meditate upon the word. And we should even memorize the word. Because as we saw in Ephesians chapter 6, the word is the sword of the spirit. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. Like literally picture yourself a sword. Like I don't know how often you think about a sword. But God is saying that all of us have a sword. We have the sword of the Spirit, and it is the Word of God. Now, imagine to yourself, what does your sword look like? All of us have been given a sword, but what does your sword look like? Does it look like, you know, a knight's sword, a double-edged, long, strong sword? Or does it look more like a butter knife? All of us have a sword, but if we're not reading it, if we're not meditating upon it, if we're not memorizing it, rather than having this long, strong, double-edged sword, some of us are fighting the devil with a butter knife. No wonder why we're struggling. No wonder why we are slipping and falling uh, in our faith. It's because our sword is like a butter knife. My wife said to give this example, so I'll just give this example. Uh, She said that, you know, sometimes we might not even be holding a sword. We might just be uh, fighting, like, the devil, like, taekwondo. We're, like, just fighting him without, like, literally, like, anything. We don't even have a butter knife. We're just fighting him with our hands and our feet. You know, without the word, uh, we are totally uh, vulnerable. We are unable to to guard ourselves. And we should, again, not only think about defending ourselves from the devil, we should also think about going on the offense. So often, we just want to put on the armor. We want to defend ourselves. But how many of us go on the offense, go on the attack? It is only through the Word of God that we're able to go on the offense. And lastly, um, the Bible 
ultimately gives us the gospel. The Bible gives us the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. At the end of verse 12, it says, Declare me innocent from hidden faults. And the end of verse 13, it says, Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Every human being, whether you're religious or irreligious, every human being knows that they are not without faults. Every human being feels that, senses that, experiences that. Every human being knows that they are not blameless, that they are not innocent. They may want to think that, but they know that they're not deep down. Every human being senses their transgressions. And that's why we have even in our vocabulary words like, I'm sorry, my bad. Like, why would we ever have to say that we're sorry or that we're bad um, if we didn't sense transgression, wrongdoings? Every human being knows that there is a right and wrong They know that there is a good and that there is a bad. It is written on our hearts as human beings. So when we wrong someone, something needs to be done to make it right, right? Whether we say we're sorry or whether we pay back for a debt or uh, whether we do something to try to redeem ourselves, something needs to be done to right the wrong. But the ultimate problem that we face is that the Bible tells us that we have not only wronged people, we have wronged God. And the wrongs that we have done towards people does not even come close to comparing the wrongs that we have done towards God. We offend people all the time, whether it's uh, intentionally or unintentionally. We offend people quite regularly. But we offend God all the time, all the time, intentionally and unintentionally. And one day, everyone has to deal with their faults, their transgressions, their offenses towards God. And we all have one of three options to right our wrongs. Uh, The first uh, option that we have is to ignore them. And that's basically the atheistic route. Basically, choosing not to believe in God. If you just choose not to believe in God, then that's your way of dealing with it. But you do have to deal with your transgressions, your sins, your wrongdoings. And that is a route that many people take. Just ignore it. I'm not going to believe that there is a God. Okay, that is one option for you. The section, second option is to deal with it. And that is the religious uh, way of dealing with it, uh, which is to... Uh, choose to believe that you can make yourself right with God. And that's why we have various religions uh, in our world, various religions through all of history. People sense that they have done evil, they've transgressed, they've done wrong, and so I'm going to do something to make myself right with God. Or we have a third option, which is to let God deal with it. And this is the gospel way of dealing with it. Choosing to believe that God makes it right for you. God dealt with our faults, our sins, our transgressions on the cross through the person of Jesus Christ. God's son, Jesus Christ, died for your sins and for mine. On the cross, Jesus asked for your forgiveness. On the cross, he said, it is finished. That means that he paid it all on the cross. He paid off all of our debts. And if you believe that, if you accept that, if you trust in that, God says all your wrongs, past, present, and future, are forgiven and forgotten. You and I are now on good terms. And we call that justification, being declared innocent, blameless from our faults, and our transgressions. David asked for this. He asked to be declared innocent. And what he asked for, he received by faith in the future Son of God. Even though David was an adulterer and a murderer, he asked God to declare him innocent 
even though he knew he wasn't. He asked for a clean heart. He asked for the righteousness of another, and he got what he asked for. He was forgiven, and he was justified. And you too can ask for this forgiveness. You too can ask for this righteousness. That is the good news of the Bible. And that is why we need to keep reading the Bible. Brothers and sisters, without the Bible, you either ignore your sins or you try to justify them yourself. It is only God who can trust, justify you of your sins. So go back to God's word and be reminded of the gospel because we forget the gospel every single day because every day we are, try- we are being deceived by the message of the world. Either ignore God or try to deal with your problems yourself. It's God's word that says, I have dealt with it. I have dealt with it on the cross. So every day we need to go back to God, giving him our sins, giving our burdens to him. And he gives us forgiveness. He gives us joy. He gives us assurance of our salvation. And so as we think about this discipline of reading the word, I pray that it wouldn't be something that you think you have to do. It's something that you get to do. It is your privilege that you get to receive the greatest news of all. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. And before I close this in prayer, I just want to give you a minute to respond to God's word. You know, have you been ignoring the problems of your sins? Have you been trying to just sweep them under the rug? Or have you, on the flip side, been trying to deal with it on your own, trying to outweigh your bad works with your good works? The Bible says that no matter what we do, we fall short of the glory of God, but he gives us the good news, the greatest news of all, that if we would just trust in him, believe in him, accept the sacrifice that he has offered to us that we can be forgiven, that we can be justified, that we can also be sanctified. And so uh, could we come before God and, and recommit ourselves to him? Could we recommit ourselves to his word? Sometimes the word is difficult. Sometimes the word is boring to us. But that's because We are just deceived and consumed by the message of this world. Could we, again, sober our minds and soften our hearts before God so that we could receive growth, so that we could be gratified, so that uh, we could receive the gospel again? So I just want to give you a minute uh, to respond to God, and after a minute, I'll close us in prayer. Let's pray.